Good morning, everyone. It is great to have you in the house of the Lord. And I know we have uh, several visitors visiting today. And if you are visiting with us, you are our special guest. And I just pray that you will be blessed uh, by the service. And so glad that you have decided to come and join us for worship this morning. So we're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer. And we're going to go right into our music. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all of your blessings and the fact that we can gather together here in this place to worship you, to exalt you, and to just praise your glorious name. And Lord, that we can gather together, Lord, to, to pray for one another and uplift one another because we are the body of Christ. We are a family. And Lord, we're so thankful that we have that opportunity. And we just invite your presence into this place Lord, that you would be exalted. Lead and guide by your Holy Spirit and in everything that is said and done. And we ask this in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you are able to stand with us as we sing, there is power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the 
bridegroom comes Will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean Are you washed in the blood of the the Lamb. Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you thankful for the shed blood of Jesus this morning? Amen. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there can be no forgiveness. And he shed his precious blood for us. Turn and greet one another before you're seated. Good morning to everyone. Sound like you're still asleep a little bit after singing two songs. Good morning. It's good to see all of you and good to have the opportunity to worship the Lord together. I'm going to invite up Melissa Jones. Uh, where is she? There she is. And uh, she's going to come share. There's a Christian camp going on, which Damascus Friends is actually leading it, right? And she's in charge. She's going to share about it. It's not for adults, though. <laughs> that. They should have you turned on. All right, like you said, I'm Melissa Jones, and I'm the Core Kids Director at Damascus Friends Church, and I have some family, obviously, that's here. I used to be a Koi, so I used to attend here, church here. It's been, I've been married for 20 years now, so it's been a while. <laughs> um, so this summer, we are having what we're calling Camp Collide, and as it says, it's August 8th through the 12th. Uh, we are offering this to kindergarten through fifth grade. They must have completed it. Um, we'll be coming Monday through Thursday for a day camp. So there will be transportation that will need to come back and forth. And then for those who have completed second to fifth grade, we will have an overnight camp available to them as well. Um, and so we're really excited about this offering. It's at a place called Camp Wanaki. I think that's how you say it. That's how I say it. I keep saying it like that. So that's how we're going to say it. Um, so Camp Wanaki is in Beach City, Ohio, um, which is about, I'm not sure how far it is from here. From Damascus Friends, it's an hour and seven minutes, so it's probably just a little further from here. Um, but we're really excited. There's 250 acres uh, for these kids to be in God's nature. Um, our goal for this time with these kids is really to draw them closer to God. And in doing that, we're going to have time set apart for them to just be, just be with Jesus and draw closer to him through his Holy Spirit, through his word, through worship and nature. There's so much nature to, that we can, we can learn so much from nature and draw closer to God just being in it. Um, we do have a representative from your church coming. Wendy Coy will be coming. Um, so she doesn't, She's excited, right, Wendy? Yes, she's really excited. Okay, yeah. awesome. We will be there. My husband, Justin, is coming too. Um, we're going to have a great team ready for these kids, and we're excited to minister with them and to them and just have a great time. Um, these cards are out in the lobby, so if you want to grab one, if you know someone who would want to know about this, you can grab it, um, and you can find out more information on the website. So thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing that. 
and thank you for Wendy for going and helping. And so it sounds like it's going to be really, really exciting. So uh, when, uh, Melissa's going to share with the kids at Junior Church, and she's also, also sharing Wednesday night. If you have any questions, I'm sure she'll be around after the service too. And I know how to get a hold of her or Wendy. So keep that in mind. So as we transition to prayer this morning, uh, that does remind me to uh, keep, um, keep VBS plans in prayer. And Wendy's our VBS director this year. And her father-in-law, Jim, is the assistant VBS director this year. So we're going to keep them in prayer. And I think you're going to start seeing sign-up sheets. I think there already is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. But sometimes I miss what's going on. So maybe there's not. Is there? There are two. There are sign-up sheets. So keep VBS in prayer and keep in mind that that's coming up. VBS and also the Resurrection Egg Hunt. We sent out a bunch of flyers about the Resurrection Egg Hunt uh, this week, last, this past week in the mail. So uh, hopefully some of you have already received them. We have things about that in the lobby as well. So keep that in mind. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to remind you of the church health survey that we sent two emails out about this past week. We sent one out on Monday, we sent one out on Thursday with the link, and also it was in our bulletin this past week, and it also should be in our bulletin today. And this church health survey is a Know Your Church survey done through Church Answers, and that's really going to help our church growth task force as we seek the Lord's vision for the future of Bethel Friends. We've already gotten the, uh, received the Know Your Community report, which is, which is interesting as well. So Know Your Church, Know Your Community, we're getting both these reports, so please help us by uh, taking the church health survey, um, which we sent you information about. And now as we actually go more specifically in prayer, please continue to keep Sam Campana in prayer. He's back there. He's recovering from a, a knee replacement on Monday, and he's at church on Sunday. How cool is that? I expect every one of you to do the same when you have knee replacements. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sam's standard may not fit for everyone, okay? I, we all understand that. So uh, uh, Cheryl Mayhew had a knee replacement on Wednesday as well. Keep her in prayer. It seems like that was kind of the end thing to do last week. Um, I, I ran this morning, so I'll be getting a knee replacement in a few years. Just pray for the timing of that. Um, anyways, we want to continue to pray for Louise Raymond, John's Ray, John Raymond's mother, uh, who's, who's at um, Hampton Woods recovering from pneumonia and in a wound. Um, and also, Leslie Bloom's here, and we'll continue to keep her in prayer. It's good to see her back today. And others, you know, keep Paul and Diane Young in prayer. Paul Young's recovering from rotator cuff surgery. Diane uh, it will be having a PET scan to, to follow up on her cancer treatments soon. The PET scan has been postponed. And we want to keep Billy Nelson in prayer, recovering from pneumonia. And my brother Michael, my older brother Michael, um, received results a week ago Friday that his uh, tumor markers were up. He's faced cancer three times now. And his tumor markers were up, and then he got the results to the my chart from a PET scan, which was done last Thursday. He got the results overnight that it does seem like they found new cancer in three places. So please keep my brother Michael in prayer as well. Also, pray for, we want, always want to pray for the offering. As I lead, the Lord, lead in prayer, it's also a dedication uh, for the offering. We don't pass the plate, just a reminder, but you can give as you feel led in the boxes at the back and also on our website, the link's in the bulletin. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we just praise you and worship you first for we truly are washed in the blood. We gather as Christians. We gather as uh, Christians who are united with you, living with you. As John chapter 15 says, you are the vine, we are the branches. We are connected to you. As John 15, 4 says, we are to abide in you, which is to say remain in you. John 15, 5, you said apart from you, we can do nothing. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you came to give us life and give it to us abundantly. Oh, Lord God, may we experience the abundant life that you offer. May we experience that abundant life because we are living with you. We are in a relationship with you. We are united to you. We are not fans of you on the sidelines. We, we are more than fans. We are, we are followers of you, but we are more than followers. Because we actually are united to you with the Holy Spirit within us. As you said, Lord Jesus, to the disciples in John 16, it was better that you leave because you send the advocate, the helper, the, the paraclete in the Greek word, the Holy Spirit to be with us. John 14, 27, Jesus, you said, my peace I leave with you, peace not as the world gives. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We celebrate that. We worship you. 
for the relationship that we have. And I know, Lord God, we go through the Lenten season right now, coming up on Palm Sunday in a matter of weeks and Monday, Thursday and Resurrection Sunday. And we know that we can only have that relationship because you went to the cross for us. You died on the cross for us. You substituted yourself in our place. You, you took the wrath of God in our place. You took our sins upon the cross, but you were also resurrected. And because you live, we too shall live. We thank you. We celebrate that. We worship you. And because of that relationship, being reconciled to the Father, we come to you in prayer. We pray for today's offering, Lord. Take it and use it for your glory and your purposes. Bless the gifts and bless the givers of the gifts for your glory, your purposes. Lord God, as I pray for the offering and as I think about the missions that's supported through offering money, we pray for the rescue mission. We pray for the Pregnancy Help Center. We lift up to you Ukraine and Abendine Bible and the missionaries there. We pray that you would keep them safe. Their daughter Priscilla the son-in-law Dan, and the many, many, many others that they are working with. We pray, Lord God, that you would minimize the loss of life. We pray, Lord God, that you would spread the gospel. We pray that, uh, that, that, that Russia's troops would, would not advance. They would, they would end up retreating. Uh, Lord, I celebrate that, as I saw in one of the emails, three people were saved one day, and, and I know there's many, many more than that, and we celebrate the victories like that. We, we celebrate their faith. May we learn from their faith and from their witness. And please keep them safe. We pray, Lord God, for the camp that Damascus Friends is heading up. Melissa Jones is leading. And we pray your blessings on that camp ministry this coming August, this summer. Bless it and guide it. May children come to know you as Lord and Savior through the camp. May children grow up in you, grow in you, have, have just awesome fellowship with you, time with you, union with you through the camp. Bless the volunteers and bless the children and families in the camp. We pray for Vacation Bible School this summer. Bless and guide all of our volunteers and guide Wendy Coy and Jim as they lead it up. You know all of the needs, Lord. We pray for Luis Raymond's healing. We pray for Cheryl Mayhew's healing from the knee replacement and Sam's healing. And Leslie Bloom, that you would heal this um, condition she has as a, as a side effect of the surgery she had. Lord God, we pray for Billy Nelson's healing. And Diane Young, when she has those tests here in a couple weeks, may they reveal no new cancer growth and the cancer has, has reduced in size. We pray for Paul Young's healing from rotator cuff surgery. And I pray for my brother Michael this morning. After you're just getting this news, I know that he's overwhelmed, he's anxious, he's concerned. And Lord God, I pray that you would encourage him. I pray that the cancer would be treatable. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would actually heal him. We know sometimes you work through certain medications and surgeries, but we know that you don't need them. We pray, Lord God, that you would intervene and heal Michael's cancer. Lord God, there are other requests. You know them all. The biggest need of all, though, is having a right relationship with you. So, Lord God, before I close this prayer, if there's anyone within this gathering, or maybe they're online listening or watching, if they are withholding sin, may they repent. May the Holy Spirit convict them. Maybe there's some, I'm sure there are, that do not know you as Lord and Savior. If that's the case, I pray, Lord God, that they would respond. Second Peter 3, 8-9 through 9 tells us that, that you're a patient, Lord. You don't want any to perish. You want all to come to repentance. Lord God, may there be people in this gathering that commit their lives to you as Lord and Savior today. Pray that you'd be glorified as we continue worship. In Jesus' name, amen. We all go through struggles and difficulties in our lives. That's just part of the fallen nature and part of sin, the struggles and difficulties. I believe if we were still in the garden, we would not experience that because I'm sure there's no one here that is... Is there anybody here that has never gone through a difficulty? Never had a struggle? Didn't think so. And I was reminded uh, yesterday at the men's breakfast that there's nothing, nothing, including accidents, as the fellow that brought forth our teaching yesterday, that if there was such a thing as an accident, that means God didn't know about it. And if he didn't know about it, then he's not God. 
So God is in control of everything. He knows the situations. He knows our struggles. He knows our difficulties. As I've said before, that there is nothing that affects us that doesn't first go through the throne room of God. And he is so faithful to us. And we're going to sing that there is not a friend like Jesus. And if you're able to stand with us as we sing this. Think about the words we are singing. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet the friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Did ever saint find this friend forsake him? No, not one. Or sinner find that he not take, take him. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in Worthy is your 
today, just all across this place, just tell him. And maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've never expressed how worthy he is, that he is the King of kings, that he is the Lord of lords. Jesus, we worship you today, for you are the Almighty One. You are the ones that spoke the worlds into existence. You're the one that makes continual intercession for us. You're a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Lord, you are almighty. You are holy. You're the first, the last, the beginning and the end. And we worship you today for you are worthy. For you are worthy. Lord, our words do not seem adequate enough to give you praise, to give you glory. We're so thankful that we can be in this place today to worship you today, to exalt you today, to give you praise and glory. Could we sing that chorus one more time? Jesus, Lamb of God. Jesus, Lamb of God, Lord, continue to bless the rest of this service, Lord, that you be exalted and glorified, and we ask it in your name. Amen. You Amen. may be seated. It's amazing how God works. Uh, the song I'm going to sing is all about worship. And you've heard the, the word worship so many times again this morning, but that's why you're here right? We're here to worship God, hear the word of God, share in fellowship. God's awesome. If I were to go around and ask you what, um, what word would describe God to you, what attributes you can think of, they're endless. The song has so many of those attributes written in these words, and that's the importance of a song is the words that are written. So pay attention to the words, the attributes that God is. God is faithful, my God is truthful, my God is boundless in all he is, my God is wisdom, and my God is righteous, my God is vision. is power and my God is glory my God is ruler over all that is my God is timeless 
and my God is justice. My God is mercy to be oppressed. So I will worship you in the beauty of holiness, and I will worship you for the things you've done in me. And when my life's complete, I'll lay my crown at your feet. Oh, I will worship you on bended knees. His name is love. His voice is thunder. His heart is tender. And his hand is strong. things you've done in me, and when my pride comes me, I'll lay my crown at your feet, oh, I will worship you on bended knees, so I will worship you in the beauty of holiness, and I will my crown at your feet. Oh, I will worship you. Oh, I will worship you, my King. I will worship you on bended knees. Amen. Let's worship God. Praise God. Thank you. It's a beautiful song to lead us into this sermon. Uh, children just missed you at Junior Church at this time. Children may make their way to Junior Church at this time. And we're going to be going to Genesis chapter 6 uh, this morning. So Genesis chapter 6, uh, you can follow Miss Melissa right to Junior Church. Children, not adults. Adults, you have to stay for the sermon. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. You know, we've been on this sermon series talking about foundations and how Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are significant, foundational to our faith, foundational to the Bible, foundational to the rest of the scriptures. We can't, we can't strip the scriptures of these chapters, allegorizing them or saying they're just myth and not think that it's going to affect the rest of the Bible. So we're on Genesis chapter 6 today, getting into the, the, the flood narrative and... By way of introduction, there's a well-known book titled, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Someone wrote the following, let me suggest everything I need to know I learned from Noah. Number one, don't miss the boat. Number two, we were all in the same boat. Number three, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Number four, stay fit. When you're 600 years old, someone may ask you to do something big. And stay fit, especially if you're 600 years old. Number five, don't listen to critics. Just do the job that needs to be done. Number six, build your future on high ground. Number seven, for safety's sake, travel in pairs. Number eight, speed isn't always an advantage. The snails were on board with the cheetahs. Number nine, when you're stressed, float a while. Number 10, remember the ark was built by amateurs. The Titanic was built by professionals. Number 10, no, 11, no matter, what, no matter the storm, when you are with God, there's always a rainbow waiting. Trust in the Lord. You know, my theme today is the world is growing increasingly corrupt. Yet Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. 
as we looked at Genesis 5 last week, as we begin Genesis 6, we see that people are living a long time. They've got a long time to build up sin in their lives. I think life in general was easy pre-flood. I think it was a different world. And so during that time, they had an easier life, a long life, and they could think up new ways to sin. And it is growing increasingly corrupt. But Noah was different. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor. As we look at this passage, oftentimes we put on our secular eyes and our secular thinking. And we end up trying to be the judge of God. We end up filling in details that are not supplied. What the scriptures tell us is the world was very corrupt. The world was very, very, very corrupt. So corrupt, and we're just beginning. We're going to spend about three weeks, I think, on the flood chapters because it's chapter 6, 7, and 8. The world was so corrupt that God decided it was best to preserve a remnant, which was Noah's family, and kill off the rest. And many times we judge God. We're the ones who sin. We're the ones who violate God's righteous standards. We're the one who, who, ones who violate God's holy, perfect standard. And we turn around and we're kind of like Adam in Genesis 3. Remember what Adam said? The woman you gave me. Adam blamed God and his wife. And we've been blaming our spouses ever since, right? And I don't know if we blame God too, but we definitely blame our spouses. And our children blame their siblings it's an everyday occurrence in my house. Not Megan and I blaming each other. The kids blaming each other. But oftentimes we blame God. It was corrupt. I don't know about you, but I think the world is growing increasingly corrupt again. But ultimately, from a biblical worldview, it's creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Everything was created good. We see that in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Creation fell. We see that in Genesis chapter 3. We are redeemed. We see that in the Gospels. But we're not restored yet. It's the already but not yet. We are redeemed, but we are not in the new heaven and new earth yet. So when we see sin around us and we see people condoning sin and people calling uh, a good evil and evil good and we see all that stuff going on and we say, what's going on in the world? Do we have an answer? Yes, we have an answer. It's in Genesis 3. We live in a fallen world. We, see in a dep- we live in a depraved world. And we see people getting sickness or illness or viruses or infection or parasites or, or whatever. And we see all these other things. Mental illness include. We see all these things going on. And they say, what is wrong with the world? Do we have an answer? Yes, we have an answer. The simple answer is Genesis 3. We live in a fallen world. We are redeemed in Christ. And Jesus still chooses to heal on certain occasions. And Jesus helps us in this life. We live with Jesus. We live united with Jesus. We live filled with the Holy Spirit. But we're not restored yet. We're not in the new heaven and new earth yet. We are in a fallen world, a depraved world. And the further we get from the Judeo-Christian worldview, the, the, the further we open the door to secularism, the more we see the fallen, depraved world. I was listening to Breakpoint on Wednesday. They release a Breakpoint commentary. You can hear Breakpoint on Moody Radio, Family Radio, other Christian radio stations. You can also listen on podcast. And they have on Wednesday, Ask the Colson Center. It's a longer Breakpoint commentary. And they answer questions. And this last week, they talked about things like, you know, um, new movies and the worldview they're trying to bring about, especially like Turning Red, I think it's called. Um, I watched it last Friday with our kids. We played Worldview Pop. Um, in other words, I heard this from one of you, actually. Uh, kids, we're going to watch this movie. I want you to pull up any different worldviews that you see. Any worldview that you notice that is not the Christian worldview or even a Christian worldview, let's talk about it. Um, that's like the worst Disney movie. I do not recommend it. Anyways, um, and can't, what's that? No one's talking about Bruno. That movie's okay. Okay, that movie's okay. But, so I'm not insulting all Disney. Anyways, you know, we see, so they're talking about different worldviews on this Breakpoint commentary, this Gold Center thing. And they said, everybody, go look up the Parable of the Madman. It's by Frederick Nietzsche. Parable of the Madman, written in 1882. 
That's when Nietzsche said, God is dead. And we're seeing that play out. I first heard of this quote by Nietzsche, God is dead and we have killed him. I first heard about that way back in college. It was a long time ago for me, maybe not for you, but a long time ago for me. And I first heard about it then, but never read the context. Nietzsche writes, have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God, as many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then. He provoked much laughter. Notice, as many of those who did not believe in God, they were standing around just then, and he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, asked one? Did he, did he lose his way like a child, asked another? Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, immigrated? Thus they yelled and they laughed as this madman said, I seek God, I seek God. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried. I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers, but how did we do this? How how could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving away from all suns? Uh, Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is Is there still any up or down? Society kills off God and kills off the biblical worldview that comes from God. Is there an up? Is there a down? Is there a right? Is there a wrong? It's kind of what he goes on to write, even though I think he was an atheist. And if you read the rest, it seems like he's saying a society can kill off God, but it takes time to see the effects of it. And we've seen the effects of it in our culture, in our society. I believe we're in this kind of great experiment of what happens we do not have a worldview of right and wrong. As Jeremiah says in the Old Testament, the people no longer know how to blush. So I get these forwarded emails, and some of them I respond to, some of them I don't. And one was just an old guy talking about how bad the world's going, and generally they're blaming the millennials. That's what seems to happen. And so I'm a senior millennial, Okay, senior millennial. So I blame the younger millennials or Gen Z. I don't know. We, all, we always do that. You can go back. I found quotes from the Puritan days where they're blaming the next generation. I found quotes from the 1930s where they're blaming the, 19, the kids in the 1930s who ended up storming the beaches in Normandy. So we're always blaming the next generation. But in this one particular one, I thought I would respond to it. And I said, why are we... <laughs> blaming the next generation because of course it was the millennials who gave us Hugh Hefner right he was a millennial and all these other you know pornographic hustler and all these pornographic magazines and all these other bad things free love shared marriage, all these other things come from the millennials right no they come from depravity they come from living in a fallen world and the further we get from the judeo-christian worldview the worse it gets along those lines I would also add They were not going to reach people with the gospel if all we are doing is criticizing them. You want to reach your children, your grandchildren with the gospel? Stop criticizing their generation. Try building more bridges and less roadblocks. We don't get anywhere being critical. All we do is have anxiety attacks. We're in a culture addicted to 24-hour news, and we wonder why anxiety is on the rise. You know what? This book called the Bible has great, great, great good news. You can read Revelation 21 and 22 and see the end. You can read Isaiah 65 and 66 and chapter 60 and Isaiah 9 about the Messiah and the Prince of Peace, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and all these other great passages. But no, we'd rather watch 24-hour news. The world is growing increasingly corrupt in Genesis 6, yet Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. I do intend to talk about this passage today by way of a long introduction. Remember that in Genesis 5.32, uh, we, we, we left Noah, and Noah is 500 years old, and he fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we saw in Genesis 5.28-29, through 29, it read, Lamech, that's Noah's father, Lamech lived 182 years, and he became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands. 
arising from the ground which the Lord had cursed. So in the naming of Noah, we see Lamech, his father, is making uh, a statement. Even, his, even in his name, he's making a statement. We want rest. We want a Messiah. We want a deliverer. They noticed that the world was getting corrupt, and they noticed that God had already prophesied, going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, God had prophesied that he's going to send a Messiah. He's going to send a Savior. And so they were awaiting the Savior, and they thought in the naming of Noah, maybe this is the guy. Maybe Noah's going to be the Savior. Maybe Noah's going to be the Redeemer. Now, he wasn't the ultimate Savior. He wasn't the ultimate Messiah. He wasn't the ultimate Redeemer. But Noah was a type. Meaning, eventually, it's kind of a foreshadowing that eventually in the New Testament, eventually, one of Noah's descendants would be the Messiah, would be Jesus. But what we see in the naming of Noah is they were hungry for a Savior. They were eager. I should use the word eager, not hungry. They weren't cannibals. They were eager for a Savior. They were awaiting for a Savior. And as I shared last week, we have never lived in a world without a Savior because a Savior had come. Even for the oldest of you, by the time you were born, the Savior had already come, died and for our sins, and rose again. We've always lived in a, in a world with the Savior. Are we so thankful and so worshipful and so grateful that God has sent the Savior, and we know him? And as I shared last week, and I want to share again because I just want to keep on pounding this truth, there are other people around us who don't know the Savior, and we need to be sharing about the gospel, and it starts with prayer. We need to make sure that our prayer list includes our family and friends that don't know the Savior. And we are praying, God, open their eyes, and God, use me. A lot of times we'd probably rather say, no, God, use that other person to share the gospel because I don't want to step out of my comfort zone. I don't, want to, I don't want to step out of my comfort zone. I don't really like talking about that. You're not, to, not supposed to talk about religion or politics. But angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents, and so should we. And if angels rejoice, don't we want to make a heaven rejoice? Don't we want to be used by God to share the gospel with other people? Now, I'm convinced that most of the American church doesn't. That's not part of my sermon days. Extra credit. I'll move on soon. But do we care? Because I think we'd rather focus on the negative, how bad the world's going, rather than the positive that God wants to save that world. God wants to save those people. The real problem is not politics. The real problem is, is, is that people need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the real problem. And that's the ultimate correction, too. That when people come to know, truly come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus changes their worldview. Jesus gives them truth. Jesus gives them answers. Jesus gives them hope. Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit. That's the real answer. So we see right here that the people at the end of Genesis 5 were waiting for a Savior. They needed a Savior. They knew they needed a Savior. And with the naming of Noah, we see that. So now that brings us to Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read them. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. This, ooh, this is interesting. Ancient aliens come out now. The sons of God, so that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. When man began to multiply in the face of the land, people are multiplying. They're multiplying. They're, the earth is getting populated. People are living old, but they don't have a Savior. They're living long in depravity, in sin, in this fallen world. They're living incredibly long. In Genesis chapter 5, each time it says that they had other sons and daughters, and each time it says that they died, they died, they died, they died. Living a long time, thinking of sin. And it says that sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. This is one of the most hotly debated verses in the Bible. That's why I mentioned ancient aliens. If you watch it, you'll see them talk about this in Ezekiel chapter 1. In Wright Pat Air Force Base. That comes up every time. I bring up Wright Pat because I'm from that area. Cheryl used to work there. The sons of God, so the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. We're just going to skip over that and move on. No, I'm just kidding. It says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive. God in this passage is the Hebrew word Elohim, Elohim. And it does not necessarily refer to the Lord. Here it is clear that it does not refer to the Lord. It's generic. So who are the sons of God, and who are the daughters of man? There's three possible answers to this that I've heard. Number one, the sons of God are fallen angels. The sons of God, which are fallen angels, which would be demons, saw that the daughters of men were attractive. 
and they took whomever they chose. And so you have demons marrying with human women and creating a very, very fallen world. Number two answer for this is royalty or despos. In other words, sometimes royalty, like Pharaoh's royalty, would be called gods. So this is saying the, the sons of the royalty married the daughters of men and created this depravity. The third, which is what I favor, is that the sons of God equals the godly line of Seth, and the daughters of men equals the ungodly line of Cain. This is a few that I favor. So it is, in Genesis chapter 5, we saw the descendants of Seth. Seth was, you know, God's, uh, Seth was Adam and Eve's better child, so to speak. He didn't murder his brother. That makes him a little bit better of a child, anyways. So we see the descendants of Seth married the daughters of men. The daughters of men would be Cain's lineage, Cain's descendants, which we see in Genesis chapter 4. So we see Cain's descendants, which are very, very, very corrupt, marry uh, Seth's descendants, which are better, that's why they're called sons of God, and when they intermarry, they create an unequally yoked marriage. And that means now everybody is corrupt. Before it was Cain's descendants corrupt, Seth's descendants are okay. But when they intermarry, now everybody's corrupt. Notice how it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. They took wives for themselves. By the way, this is a parallel with Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. In Genesis 3, 6, um, Eve took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she saw that it was beautiful, and so she took. We see that as a parallel. So basically, the sons of God are doing something that is not good. They're marrying the, the depraved daughters of men, their unequally yoked marriages, which, by the way, there's a New Testament um, instruction about that, which we'll come back to. 2 Corinthians 6.14 talks about Christians not marrying non-Christians. You know, it is true that sometimes in the Psalms, angels are called gods. You can see Psalm number 8, verse 5. But that is a general word, Elohim, a generic word for God. And, and, and Jesus did say that angels cannot marry or be given in marriage. And so it's believed that they really cannot procreate. That's Matthew twenty-two thirty. So it seems that holding a view that, that this is about demons having sexual intercourse with human women mixes in ancient Middle East myths as well as ancient Greek mythology with scripture. Now, there are very godly people, very educated teachers that disagree with me on this, so I'll just go ahead and say that, but I believe it's based off context. Chapters were not there in the original Old and New Testament. So Genesis chapter 4 flows smoothly to Genesis chapter 5, flows smoothly to Genesis chapter 6. In other words, the genealogy of, of, of Cain's descendants in 4 flows smoothly to Genesis 5, the descendants of Cain, of, of Seth, right to here. So contextually, I think that makes the most sense. They saw the daughters of men were beautiful, or it could be literally good, meaning they were good as wives, they take them. Now verse 3, then the Lord said, my spirit, this is God speaking, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. So it seems that right here, God is saying, people are living way too long. For now on, they're only going to live 120 years old. And if you look at it, it doesn't happen right after the flood. But by the very end of the books that Moses authored, God inspired Moses to write, at the very end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies at 120 years old. So it seems like it's a gradual thing that started right there. And let's move on. Verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Much has been said about that word Nephilim. And, and, and people start to think the sons of God were the daughters of men and they were demonic relations with human women and that created Nephilim and they think Nephilim were giants. That's not true. If you look up the Hebrew word for Nephilim, it just means fallen ones. This means fallen ones. It created a more depraved culture. And let me just say right now, in the church we see it too. When, 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 when Christians marry non-Christians, it is an unequally yoked marriage. And more often than not, it brings down the Christian. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. The Lord is seeing... Now, in reality, God already knows. 
When it says the Lord saw, this is ascribing to God human attributes, which is to say this is anthropomorphic language. Anthropomorphic language. That just means to ascribe to God human attributes. God is omnipresent. He's outside of time. God already knows what's going on. It's just, it's just talking of God like a human. He's seeing things, and he's, and he's grieved over this. Humans are wicked, every intent of the thoughts of his heart continually. This is a very sad verse. This is sad. It says constantly wicked. They're living hundreds of years and thinking up new ways to sin. Many times we end up judging God for the flood, but why don't we realize how much this likely grieved God? How much people might have been stepping in saying, God, when are you going to fix this? When are you going to correct things? Much like in Revelation chapter 6, verses uh, 6 and 7, we see saints who were martyred during the tribulation period. They were martyred for their faith during the tribulation period. And they're talking to God saying, How long, O Lord? How long until you bring judgment, until you make things right? God was grieved over what's going on right now. God was hurt by the utter depravity, which probably included child sacrifice, temple prostitution, um, and many, many, many other depraved things. Verses 6 and 7. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. And so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them. The Lord is grieved. Again, my initial response to this passage is that it's anthropomorphic language. God is perfect. God cannot have regrets like we would. We've all had regrets, right? Like we do something and we're like, oh, I shouldn't have done it that way. You know, we all have those types of regrets. God doesn't make mistakes. If God did, then he wouldn't be perfect, but God is perfect. So this is likely anthropomorphic language. Again, it's ascribing to God human attributes. Though I do have another thought on this. God does not have emotions like we have emotions. There is a doctrine called the impassibility of God impassibility of God. Impassible means not able to experience passions. Not able to experience passions. It is a controversial uh, doctrine. It's controversial because in Scripture, we see that God does have passions. God does have passions. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit, and in Ephesians 4.30, it says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. So, so what does it mean, the impassibility of God? God can never be the victim of emotions. God has passions. But God is not the victim of emotions. We can be taken by surprise, right? We can be taken by surprise in anger and fear and anxiety and worry and sadness. And in those cases, oftentimes, we're not making objective decisions, we're just getting mad and flying off the handle and getting upset because we're taken by surprise and anger. That doesn't happen with God. God is not the victim of emotions. Tears can sneak up on us, but not on God. God, God does not get knocked around by emotions. God is not at the beck and call of evil, provoking him to anger or grief. So, you know, on one, in one case, I think this is anthropomorphic language. God had regretted, and this grieved him. But I like what John Piper shares in his book, Providence. He says, I conclude, therefore, that Genesis 6, 6 does not call God's foreknowledge into question, but shows the complexity of God's emotional life. The complexity of God's emotional life that is far above our ability to question or comprehend. God's emotional life is so complex, far above our ability to comprehend. Even in our experience... There are times when we look back on difficult decisions we made and feel both sorrow at making them and yet approve of making them, right? We can look back on difficult decisions and we can say, I'm sorry that I had to make it, but we approve of making it. And that could be what's going on in God's emotions right here. Remember, God is omnipresent. This means that he's present everywhere and outside of time. He knows all things. He knows the future. He could not regret like we do. Moving on, verse 7 is about the flood. Again, God is sorry that he created humans. God is going to bring judgment. And I want to reiterate, quit judging God. We are no different than Adam. Judging God. Secondly, I want to say it seems that things were very corrupt. 
Don't fill in the gaps that you do not know. We do not know, we do not have a clue how bad things were and we start judging God. Thirdly, and don't forget this, I think there's grace right here. I think there's grace right here. There's grace in the midst of judgment. God would have been totally just to kill off all humanity. They violated God's standard. God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. God is pure. And every sin is an abomination against God. Every sin is high treason against God Almighty. God would have been totally just to just say, I'm done. But he didn't. He preserved a remnant through Noah's family. He knew someday he's going to send a savior Jesus the Messiah, and the Messiah is going to save us from all of our sins, past, present, and future. And we're going to have redemption, and we're going to have eternal life in him. We're going to have fullness of life in him, and so much more. There is grace right here. There is grace. By the way, I believe that in the midst of the flood, in the midst of those who were judged, children went straight to heaven. There could have been a lot of people who died in the flood, who this was an act of God's grace. He was saving them from the perversion of the people. He was saving those children from growing up and being child sacrifices or temple prostitutes, you know, and all that other stuff. Children were rescued. This is God's grace as well as judgment. Noah found favor, Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is key to the rest of the narrative. God noticed Noah. Noah was not perfect, but it seems that his patterns of life were following God. So I want to make some applications and summaries. It seems that the godly line of Seth married the ungodly line of Cain, causing unequally yoked marriages that have resulted in a corrupt world. May this be a reminder against being unequally yoked. As Christians, we must not be unequally yoked in marriage. This means we must not have Christians marrying non-Christians. But also... I think this can apply to business practices and other things. When you have a Christian worldview mixed with a non-Christian worldview in business, it can, be very, uh, it can be very destructive as well. May that be a reminder. The Lord is grieved by our sin. May we also pray that we are also grieved over our sin. Does it grieve us? Does sin grieve us? In verse 5, Genesis 6, 5, we see that the people were into evil continually. May we guard our heart. May we guard ourselves against getting into constant evil. May we, may we live out Galatians 5, 20, 20, 22 and 23. The fruit of spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we live trying to gain victory over sin, living with Jesus. This is a lesson on the depravity of men. This is a lesson on how bad we can get. Don't blame God. We have the sin problem. Don't be like Adam who blamed God and his wife when he sinned. Don't blame your spouse and don't blame God, okay? And may we find favor in the eyes of the Lord. May we find favor in the eyes of the Lord. We see a culture, a world right now, right, that has killed off God. And they're increasingly trying to kill off God. But we haven't. If you're here and you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you know the Lord. You are united with Jesus. You know the answer to the greatest questions about life. You have a union with Christ. And we are called to be a light to the world. As we go, and I pray that we would challenge ourselves, pray that we can be a light in a very dark, dark world. Many Christians have done it in the past, and we can do it in the future. And through that, God can redeem, save many, many people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this passage of Scripture, though it's in a way very, very sad. I thank you for the grace. I thank you for the grace of preserving Noah and his family. And through Noah and his family, uh, a few thousand years later, probably 4,000 or so years later, sending our Savior, Jesus. Lord God, we celebrate that. Lord God, I pray that we live in a relationship with you. And we let our light shine to other people. Spreading the gospel everywhere we go. Because, Lord God, we know we are your witnesses for good or for bad. Or should I say we are either your witnesses, being a positive testimony of the gospel, or either we are a negative witness of the church. 
Don't let us be a negative witness. May we walk with you and have God's space spiritual conversations everywhere we go. Use us for your glory and your purposes and be exalted and glorified as we worship you in this closing song. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're able to stand with us, we're going to sing the first verse of Living for Jesus. salvation, for your redemption. Back in the days of Noah, you knew how you were going to bring us along and save us. We thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for that gift of life. Lord God, we just praise you and thank you for being able to gather here today and worship you in all that we do. I pray that we worship you throughout this week and praise you in all that we do, Lord Jesus. Guide us, give us your strength in anything that we go through. Heal us where we need healing. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thy atonement didst give thyself. 